the Navy uh, did pass on to the incident commander uh, the uh, acoustic uh, data that they had received. Um, uh, but they were also quick to make clear that they couldn't be definitive about what that data meant. And they couldn't be clear that that data was connected to the Titan, to the submersible. But they did pass that information up to the incident commander, um, as you would expect they would, and um, and I'm sure that that was factored into the search plan in some way, but I'd refer you to the Coast Guard to speak to specifics. Are concerns that resources were wasted in, in searching the area the size of Connecticut? No. Uh, I think the Coast Guard has spoken <laughs> definitively about this and, and quite well uh, every day here, or at least uh, every day till, till we got the tragic news, um, that there was an awful lot of effort put into uh, trying to locate the, the Titan. Uh, look, when you're in a search and rescue op operation, uh, particularly at sea, particularly in deep sea. I mean, time is not your friend. And I think you can see from the the way in which this was put together in a pretty quick fashion with a lot of resources from, as Kareen mentioned, from multiple countries, uh, that the, uh, there was a, a tremendous effort put forward to try to, to find the Titan as quickly as possible, knowing that time was not going to be anybody's friend. I think a number of things are going to be done simultaneously. Uh, there could be federal and state investigations. There could be investigations by foreign countries, particularly France and any other country that has a national who was lost in, in this. Uh, Canada would have an issue, uh, but I don't see a single unified global investigation. Uh, we've, we've even in the major oil spills and cases like that, we find national interest. So I, I think that's part of it. Uh, recovery of debris may be important. It may be impossible. Uh, we've we've seen this type of damage over the years, catastrophic hull failure from an implosion, and it's really hard to A, locate it, and B, pick up things. It's a basic factor. If you put something in an environment where the force is going to destroy it, it is going to shatter. It's, it's like hitting an eggshell with a hammer, stepping on a can of beer and watching it explode. Something of that nature is what happened. Uh, the deeper it is, the greater the force, the smaller the parts are going to be. And when they're strewn around the bottom of the ocean at the bow of of the original ship, Titanic, uh, the ability to find them, lift them, and then put them together will be difficult. I, I think we're going to find we, we don't have all the parts and maybe not able to reconstruct anything of, of great value to the investigator. <laughs> uh, one of the issues are the statements made by various people before the event, including one of the men who was lost uh, <clears throat> at the casualty. So there's a lot out there, and I expect that we'll soon probably be looking at uh, civil litigation in the United States, admiralty litigation, and that could include an ancient practice called the limitation of liability proceeding, where the owners attempt to, A, say it's not their fault, but if it is, if it was their fault, their liability, if any, is limited to the post-casualty value of the ship. And that's based on an 1851 federal statute that still is in effect. We've gone through many cases where the post-casualty value of the ship is zero. You know, we're all free to do what we want and take, take risk, but we also need to rely upon agencies or governments to m tell us what those risks are or could be. Uh, you know, why do we have stickers on our cars? Why do we have speed limits on highways to minimize those risks? And I think this this whole case fits that scenario. Uh, and I'm not a big I'm not a big advocate of government overregulation at all.
I don't see anything that screams out for criminal prosecution right now, but when you have multiple fatalities and you have people saying that the systems were not, were, were risky and that the, there was a possibility of death, I think prosecutors are gonna look into that. If you look at national, you, the Federal National Transportation Safety Board, or something that has maritime experience. I, I don't think NTSB has experience with this type of uh, vessel or event, but they have general experience with all types of shipping and cargo and uh, some horrendous casualties over the years with you know, tens or more people and passenger ships. So that's where I would start looking if, if, if Congress were to ask my opinion where to, where to begin look and then you know, focus in and maybe create a new, new structure. It went through a rigorous test program and has obviously been used in the science expeditions. Too. structure could not handle it. And the best layman's example of that is having a Coke can. The example of that is having a Coke can, okay? Imagine you put that Coke can in a pressure chamber, it buckles, 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 at one point it collapses. Obviously something went wrong. You can simply blame the design. They used carbon fiber. Uh, nobody had ever made a, a carbon fiber pressure hull for that depth before. It is very difficult to test uh, and verify. Uh, carbon fiber are very, very strong in tension. They're not so strong in compression. I never believed in that technology of wound carbon fiber, you know, wound filament uh, cylind cylindrical hull. There was a lot of concern about this outfit and this sub. A lot of concern, even to the extent that I wasn't involved in it because I was making Avatar 2 at the time, but a lot of them got together and wrote a letter to, uh, to OceanGate and said, you have to certify. You cannot take people down. It's irresponsible. And it could lead to catastrophe. Literally, the word catastrophe is in the letter. Yeah.